Yes, she's asking, with all the technology interstellar civilizations must have, why can't they just come and fix this mess? And I, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, they absolutely could. But would it be wise? No. Here's a, a sort of a prosaic and sort of example. How successful was our attempt to establish Jeffersonian democracy in Afghanistan after a trillion dollars and hundreds of thousands of deaths? Not very. In other words, a civilization or culture has to evolve. And if a civilization that's a more advanced civilization were to try to impose something, it would be an unmitigated disaster and wouldn't be effective. Number two, if they were to do anything too overt, it will be used immediately by the intelligence community to say, we're being invaded. You look at what charlatans have done with disclosure project materials. I gathered together all these people at strategic air command bases, all this stuff, where ET craft were outside the silos, took 16 to 20 intercontinental ballistic missiles, hydrogen bombs, offline. The captain and the other guys who were there said they felt the ETs were trying to say, please don't blow up this beautiful planet, but if you go to a full launch with the Soviet Union, we can stop it because life on this planet is precious. It's been turned into this thing of ETs have been here tampering with our national security and are a threat to our survival. Okay, So you can take the same data point and spin it. So if an interstellar civilization were to do anything too overt before we have educated each other and made sense out of this, it's going to get spun by the spinmeisters who have already primed the pump with Independence Day, the movie, video games, the whole abduction, mutilation cults, which by the way, quick part of that story, man-made. I know the guys who are making the craft and the little grays and other creatures that look like aliens. Those are PL programmed life forms that are man-made. We've been making those for decades. You know about this? Yeah, absolutely 100%. So, in fact, I have a Strategic Studies Institute document, SSI uncontested from the mid-90s, 96, I believe, that states about creating a global UFO abduction cult for the psychological warfare value of it, using advanced man-made objects and life forms. So the Stan Romanek tape that I've seen wasn't released because Disney bought it up and took it off the market. Disney's always been in the back pocket of CIA. Yeah, since World War II, by the way. Um, absolutely true. I have a document that proves it. <laughs> it's a fascinating document. It talks about a CIA document from the 50s, talks about Disney Studios making cartoonish movies about this subject for, so it would be ridiculed and be a laughing stock. So Disney bought up this tape, but if you look at it, it's this kind of, it looks like a typical gray. It's walking very robotically. And the man who, where it appeared in his house, had someone in the intelligence community that I think used to work with his father in the Air Force say, it's one of the fake ones. But the UFO and MUFON investigators and this gentleman had no idea what a fake one was. I said, well, in the 80s, there was research that came out that showed that there, is a, these, there are these man-made, military-operated kind of androids that are nano-bio machines, so they have integrated circuits in their cerebral cortex. It's easy. You know, when Paris de Cuellar was kidnapped out of his limousine, see you in Secretary General in 1989, November, and they were planning, you know, Gorbachev, Reagan, and Paris de Cuellar were planning to do a massive disclosure on the UFO subject. It got stopped. How did it get stopped? This rogue element within the intelligence community abducted him using those technology out of his limousine. Bud Hopkins thought it was aliens wasn't. I had a meeting with um, Prince Hans Adam von Lichtenstein, who explained all this to me. Now, he thought it was ET also. I said, no, it was alien, but not extraterrestrial. I used the word alien to connote the man-made scary stuff, because it's a xenophobic word, and the ones that are interstellar are called ET. It's a little play on words. Very important distinction, though. And so Paris de Cuellar was told that if they didn't stop the effort to disclose this subject to the world, everyone involved, including the President of the United States, would be abducted. 
include that was Papa Bush at the time, not Reagan. I, I misspoke. Bush elder. And quote, this blew up like an atomic bomb in the Bush White House. Now Bush was a member of Magic, but Magic is not a monolith. There are these rogue elements who are doing this stuff. Very complicated. We could be here till tomorrow morning. I couldn't get through all the machinations of these dysfunctional, this dysfunctional group. So that's why they know that we have got to educate ourselves about this, begin to make contact, bring this out. Obviously, the technologies they possess, you know, it could be done, but what effect would it have? Um, it has to come from inside out. If it's for, and you know, there's a, a wonderful book that was written not long ago, a mainstream business book, about the distinction between power and force. And it's inversely proportional. Force is one tenth the effic effectiveness of genuine power. So if it's forced, it never works well. And haven't we learned that in the last decade in the Middle East? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, sorry. Are you speaking? I can't hear you. Do ETs believe they have a God? Yes, I'm sure they understand that there's universal awareness and they may not call it what we call it. But it would be more of a Jeffersonian concept of a supreme universal uh, conscious yes. being. Yes, and you have a question. Yeah, um, the Greenpeace is, is known worldwide. Um, I'm sorry, what's heard? Greenpeace is uh -huh. known worldwide. Mm -hmm. No. In fact, the head of Greenpeace for Australia was at this confab in Australia and was probably the most hostile person to me there. Because, well, because they think they know what the problem is and all the solutions. And so, the, the, interestingly, the hubris that goes with that. Now, there may be other people in Greenpeace who'd be interested. I haven't found any yet, but this person was incredibly hostile to the idea that there would be classified technologies that would be a solution instead of windmills and solar panels. So, um, no, he was absolutely, and even though we were showing dispositive evidence and documents to the effect, but uh, no, he was very, very, very hostile. Now, I hope there are some Greenpeace people who would not be hostile. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. just part of your imagination? Yeah, well, this is a great question. When you're doing the meditation and remote viewing, how do you know the difference between something that's objectively real and your imagination? You don't unless there's some external confirmation. So something that happens that confirms it. So in other words, most of the important CE5 events, there have been remote views on our team or lucid dreams where it's actually been seen and happened in advance. Does that make sense? Where we've actually seen the event and they will actually go to that place. And then if it happens, then it's been confirmed. But many times you need some sort of external confirmation um, or objective confirmation. So it's just one tool that's used. And the only way to get good at that is to practice it. You know, your phone rings, don't look at it, get a feel and sense of who it is. The doorbell rings, don't run and open the door, try to sense. So if you practice meditation enough, you'll begin to be able to do this. In the emergency department, I was a trauma guy, you know, I'd have people come in and like this one patient I had came in with the flu. But I looked at him as a young bloke like you, maybe 20s, and I looked at him and I said, oh my God, he's got a brain tumor. Two boys, two kids with him. And of course I turned to the nurse who was this wonderful hillbilly nurse in North Carolina. And I said, I need a stat CT of the head. And she said, Dr. Greer, he's only got the flu. I said, just do it. Luckily, I didn't have to go through a bureaucrat or an insurance company or any other Nazis that run the healthcare system. Because in the emergency department, you order it, it's done. So we go in there, and he has this massive brain tumor that is an astrocytoma that's pushing his foramen magnum, the brain stem, down to the opening at the base of the skull, giving him the fever, the chills, the nausea, all simulating the flu. He had no other neurological findings, none. The neurosurgeon said, how did you even think to get this CAT scan. I said, oh, I just had a hunch. I couldn't tell him I had felt it and seen it. You know how they train golden retrievers to find cancers? Well, humans, I mean, we, <laughs> I guess I'm like a big golden retriever, but <laughs> I'm big and I'm furry, but, <laughs> but that, it really is very effective. But you have to practice it and then get the objective feedback from reality. And otherwise, yeah, you just can stay in, in sort of something that can't be con 